Okay, anyway. Um, when I think of David Lankus, I think of journeys. Uh, journey, David, for instance, has made a personal journey from to become a full professor at his institution. <laughs> David has made a journey from wellness to sickness and back to wellness again. But finally, David is going to take us all and help us uh, understand the journey that we've all been on. And he does that perhaps better than anybody I know. And uh, my friend, our David Lynch. There you go. Guy hug. So. You guys figure out the right light that you can. Right there. No. That's not <laughs> it. <laughs> That's not it. Get the extra bright lights on there. You kind of them, okay? Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Come on, Fritzian. So I, I feel, I feel like a complete fraud being up here because I get to come at the end. How come and, everyone uh, says that? <laughs> you know, that's true. You are well, not a fraud. All right. I'm, not <laughs> I'm, I, I'm good enough, and gosh darn it. <laughs> so, but before, you know, I feel like also we had this big peak moment. Thanks, Ann, for taking the whole thunder on that one. But no. Um, and I got an email yesterday afternoon from my mentor and former advisor and good friend Mike Eisenberg, and I get these emails out of the blue, and he said, Lankus, future of libraries and librarians in under 200 words, go. <laughs> and I was sort of struggling with that for a while and you know, writing back and I figured I'm just going to send him a picture of you guys because I really think that's where we are. So there's my kiss up moment. But is it involve OAI? It, yes. We will not be answering any OAI questions at the end of this one. Damn it. So, Thank you. I, um, I have been on a journey, and I wanted to talk about it because I think there's great parallels to the journey that you have been on. And I'm going to take the great lead from Jay and Catherine in their, I think, beautiful, wonderful keynotes, which is to talk a little about personal journeys and hope that they're useful. I'm, I'm a huge fan of parables, the idea that, you know, you learn well through stories. We learn through these stories. So I'm going to tell you my story, but I think you'll, you'll hopefully see some parallels. So, as many of you, unfortunately, have been afflicted with often hearing, um, I had this really interesting event happen when I was in um, Amsterdam in 2012-ish, which is I just didn't feel well. And I came home and I tried to figure out what was going on, and that led to some interesting times when I actually couldn't speak anymore. That was fun. Or, or I thought I could and couldn't, and seizures, and all this wonderful stuff. And finally, they figured out what was wrong with me, and that was that I had cancer. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is actually a picture of me, and I have to say, I mean, one, I, the cult-like environment is partly why I shaved my head, but they, all the technicians wanted the shaved heads guys because they were the easiest ones to figure out where they things went. So. Something very interesting happens, though, that when you get sick and when you go through chemo and when you go through treatment, I should just give you a little bit of just quick history. They diagnosed me with Hodgkin's lymphoma. There's a pretty standard regime called ADVD, a chemo regime they put you on. It lasts about six months, and all was happy, and we were done, and chemo was great, and it wasn't gone yet. And so then they went in, and they found, nope, it's still there. And so then your next option is something called an autogelous stem cell transplant. But most people know it as a bone marrow transplant, that in essence, you gotta change your blood because it's coming from somewhere. And the good news is that my bone marrow hadn't been infected, and so I could, in essence, donate to myself. That's the autogelous part. <coughs> and so it sounds kind of interesting. Actually, it sounds very science fiction y. I had a great oncologist, and he lied to me beautifully because <laughs> we sa I said, All right, so what's the next step? And he said, Well, you ever see those Bugs Bunny cartoons? And I'm just like, oh, this is not going to go well. <laughs> he says it's like when Elmer Fudd is hunting Bugs Bunny and he shoots at him, and Bugs Bunny takes off his own head, the bullet passes by, and he puts his head back on. That's what it's like. I said, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> he said, you know, in essence, what we're going to do is kill you, and then we'll give you, you know, your bone marrow back, and you'll live. 
hopefully. So this is a very interesting endeavor because as you go through, certain things begin to happen. You, you come in this sort of really scary world. See this parable part? Where you're not quite sure what's going to happen and you're told repeatedly, it's going to be okay, it's going to be fine. But they you know, sort of gloss over the point that there's a 90% cure rate for Hodgkin's lymphoma with first-line treatment. They sort of forget the fact that you didn't work, right? So you're on the wrong side of that curve. And the other one is they say, no problem, this great autogalous stem cell transplant, it has a 50% chance of success. And you're going, but that's 50% of 10%. This is not really happy news. But you go through it, and you don't look for chemo. And as one doctor said, it starts with chemo. But you've been through chemo. But that's where we hit you with a hammer. Now we're going to use a sledgehammer. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Now they're getting better, right? You want to go back to Bugs Bunny. But now you're with sledgehammers. And it's true. What happens is they give you this chemo, and it begins as this toxic, and it sort of takes you out. And what happens is, unlike the first round, where I could go out and I could talk and speak and, you know, I had hair for a while. It was fun. What happens with the second chemo is that you begin to shrink your world. You know, so before this, I was going to Rome and I was going to Liverpool and I was going all around the world and it was great. And pretty soon, no, you're, you can't do that anymore. So your world becomes home and work and the hospital. And after a while, as your blood levels begin going down, your world becomes home and the hospital. And then at the end of it, your world becomes a hospital ward that is 42 steps long. And you know it's 42 steps long because when they give you the chemo, when they, in essence, wipe out your bone marrow, you are isolated in a ward that is 42 steps long. So I was talking to the nurse and I was sort of trying to figure out what to expect and how to expect it and how you could get through it. And she said, all right, it's really simple. The way you get through a bone marrow transplant is you walk, you shower, you brush your teeth a lot, you wash your hands all the time, and you clean your butt. I swear to God, that's what she said. <laughs> so I'm like, great, kindergarten, got it. <laughs> And so you go in, and, and so you go in on the day, what you've done is you've gone through all this chemo, they've taken a PET scan, the cancer's <laughs> gone. Now what they do is they collect your bone, you, these stem cells, which is like dialysis and apheresis machine, it's great. And then you go in, you sign this form that says, yes, I am going to participate in this activity. Yes, I realize that I can pull out at any time. Yes, I realize that if I pull out at any time, I will face certain death. It's the only form I've ever had that has had the phrase certain death. Oh right? my God. Yeah. And by the way, someone actually left in the middle. It turns out, he's like, you really? He's like, well, they were a crack addict and they need some crack. I'm like, okay, good choice. <laughs> <laughs> so you go through this thing, and I, I just have to say, on the first day you show up, you feel pretty good. You feel fine. And they start giving you these ice chips before they administer the final chemo, the, the ones that are actually going to wipe out your bone marrow. And the reason they give you the ice chips is to restrict the circulation in your mouth. Because as these toxins are going through your blood, you have lots of blood vessels. And if they don't restrict them, you'll get more blisters and it will begin eating away at your mouth. Yay. And I'm like, when, what happens to the rest of my body now? <laughs> well, good news. You're basically a tube, right? This is the start of it and it's all gone. It just gets ripped apart, but it'll come back. Great. <laughs> so you're in and you're going through these toxins and you're waiting for your blood levels to go to zero. You go in on day negative nine and you're walking because there's nothing else to do except watch Rebo reruns, which for some reason I really enjoyed Rebo reruns. <laughs> and what I'm thinking about is Catherine's thing about the tiger because this is literally most of your day is going back and forth and you're carrying a pump with you the whole time and you're doing 42 paces looking at the floor, 42 paces, and the nurses are there saying, you gotta get up, you gotta walk, and you're fine, because that's what you do. But then day, one, day negative zero becomes day zero when they give you the chemo, or when they give you your stem cell back, becomes day three, becomes day four, and this is day eight. And day eight is when your entire white blood cell count goes to zero. Oh. 
Now, here's the trick. Everyone thinks white blood cells take out infections, which they do. The other thing they do is repair your body. And so what's happened now is they've filled your body full of toxins and they've killed the ability to repair it. Right? And so all you can feel is the fact that you feel like crap. You have the worst sore throat you've ever had in your life. You just don't want to get out of bed. But what do the nurses do? They get up and they say, you got to walk. You're 42 steps. Your wife comes in and she says, get up. You're going to walk. You're 42 steps. And you're like, I don't want to get out of bed. And your mother comes in and says, get up. You're going to walk. You're 42 steps back and forth and back and forth. And for these 20 days that you're in the hospital, you can't see your children because it's February and it's cold and flu season. And having your 10-year-old visit you can literally kill you. You think about this as you're doing your 42 steps and you're like, no, I can't do it. I can't go in. And the nurses say, get up, 42 steps and 42 steps. And the nurses say it and your wife says it and you just do 42 steps and then day eight, nine comes and then day 10 comes and then day 11 comes and you start to feel better. And your blood levels go up and suddenly you go from zero to 0.5. And then you go from 0.5 to 1, and people are cheering you. And at 4, they say, you're done. And over those days, over those 20 days in the hospital, walking 42 steps at a time, I did 33 miles walking back and forth and back and forth. And you go home. And home is good, because home is where you can celebrate birthday parties, 14th birthday parties of your oldest son. And you know what we call these our mudslide cakes? Because obviously, and we deliberately <laughs> did this, but it didn't start that way. You know? so, and what's funny is when you go home, you think you're done. But when you walk out of a hospital, it is one of the scariest things you've ever done. The doctor's not there. The nurses aren't there. The, the, the drugs aren't available on 24-hour requests. I mean, by the way, if you ever want to become a drug addict, cancer. You can, ask, you can ask for anything. I swear to God, if I said, excuse me, can I get some meth? They're like, give me a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. they, they talk about in the hospital, there, there's this, so Hodgkin's lymphoma does this interesting bimodal loop. So you get it when you're in your 20s or you get it with, in your 60s. And there's this uh, weird, so I'm a weird one in the middle. And they say, it's interesting, the 20-year-olds, when they go through this process, don't get out of bed. They don't get out of bed. They're just like, more Ativan, more Ativan, just knock me out. <laughs> and then the 60-year-olds, they don't get out of bed because oftentimes they can't. But they say, oh, when we get you one of you 40 years, we're back and back and back. I think it's because the 20-year-olds take walking for granted. And suddenly at 40, you're like, you know, I, I could lose the ability to walk. Let's keep going. But you go home. And one of the amazing side effects, the amazing side effects, and you would not believe it by looking at me, is that when you look at food, it's not nausea, it's just this amazing, intense desire not to eat. You, I, you can't describe what you feel like when you're chemo. Like, one time you wake up and they're like, do you feel nauseous? I said, I feel like I've got an angry bowling ball in my stomach weighing its two options randomly. <laughs> <laughs> And so now you've got the hospital because you still have to go back once a week to make sure your blood's still going. You got home. And then you get really, really, really brave and you go to work. And so you put a sign on your door that says, you can kill me. Have a nice day. <laughs> they do a great job of this. They say, look, it's not like when you were in the hospital and you had zero, but you got a dumbass immune system now. That's more or less how they put it. They said, you might have the soldiers, but you got no one to tell them what to do. They don't know what antibodies are. Don't get too close to veterans. Why? Because when they went to Iraq, they gave them smallpox vaccinations and they used a live virus. Do you want to die of smallpox? 
Don't, and by the way, polio too. Polio? <laughs> Since the 50s? And so you go there and you're like, I don't want to go to work and I'm scared of these people and they're scared of me. And they're like, my wife sits there and goes, you go to work. And Jill, my great colleague and my great friend on the faculty, sits there and says, Dave, come on, it's time to walk. 42 steps, 42 steps, 42 steps. And then you feel brave enough that you take your first trip. And I, my first trip was to Albany, to our state library, and a meeting there. And so I had this 2 o'clock meeting, I go early, I'm there at 1.30. And it's this great big marble modernist building, and I'm sitting in the lobby waiting for my meeting, and suddenly my hands start getting sweaty, and my heart starts pounding, and I'm going, what is going on? It was my first panic attack. I said, I'm fine, I'm fine, what is going on here? I don't have panic attacks, this is crazy. I can't do this. And I call my wife and I say, I, I want to be in a fetal position in the floor of the state library. And she said, David, go outside. Start walking. 42 steps. 42 steps. 42 steps. And I made it. And then Glenn calls and says, David, we love you. Are you coming to Springfield? <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Yes. <laughs> and so you get on the plane. And you get on the plane and you look like this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who was, someone was on the plane with me. Did, yes? Okay. Someone said they were, they were oh. saw me on the plane from well, Chicago? I was like, behind me. I was like, oh, you're too cool. I can't see <laughs> <laughs> You got to wear a mask. You've got to disinfect everything. I mean, like, everyone's sitting there going, does he have Ebola or is he going <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. And, you know, it's been a long time since I've been on a plane. It was, this was the first plane trip I'd been on in a year, and that was a year since the last one. And those things bounce in the air, and that's scary. <laughs> and so how do you do it? How do you get on a plane for the first time in a year when you think that someone coughs in your face and it's recycled air? What are you going to do? You walk through security and you take 42 steps through security. You came here and you had a lot of the things that you believed in challenged. You had a lot of your security pulled away. You had a time where the basic tenets of how you thought librarianship would work or your organization should work or what you could do were pulled out from under you. And that's scary. And I know that from the conversations we've heard and from the feedback we've gotten, there have been times when you've sat there and those hands get sweaty and you begin to say, I can't do this. And what happens is your teammates, your mentors, the instructor, Gwen, Ann, Sandy, Ann, sit there and say, 42 steps, 42 steps. We may not say it's 42 steps. We may say, just take a small, move that needle a little bit, as Jay told. Just take a moment to figure out what's going on. And so now you're at the end. You've gone through this. You're at day 20, and we're about to walk off the wharf. And that structure, you may think, is gone. But here's what I learned when I was having a panic attack at the State Library, when I was getting on the plane, is that I still had the network. My wife could still call up and say, 42 steps. 42 steps. My mother was there to say 42 steps. Jill was there to say 42 steps. Gwen was there to say 42 steps. We're glad you're here. We want to see you. And you have that. And you have that right now. That we are stronger together is a message that I saw on this slide and slides today and slides before and something you've heard. And you're still together. So when you leave today, when you go in and back to your organization and you hit that manager or supervisor that doesn't get it, Take a deep breath, go outside, walk your 42 steps, and then call your teammate. And then, if your teammate's not available, call your mentor. And if your mentor's not available, call me. And we'll talk about what those 42 steps look like. What's that first step? How do we do it? Because that's the network that we built. But I lead you, this is the beginning. I'm not one year old yet. In February, I'm going to celebrate my second birthday. Right? Well, good news. You've just been born. It's time for you as you move ahead, and you're going to stumble, and you're going to have panic attacks, 
and you're gonna look at you're gonna look at food and go, God, no more food, right? It's the same <laughs> thing. Except bacon. Except bacon. <laughs> but that's what it's about. That's why we do our lead you. We talk about awesome librarians and awesome projects, and you're like, yeah, 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 but God, I hope I present well on that last day. And you get a standing ovation. The standing ovation is because you took those 42 steps. That project that you're done is not <coughs> the result. The result is this room. And this room is added to the llamas who showed up. And the air llamas are part of the group that went through Ohio and Idaho and went through all of these folks. And this network is how we're going to do it. Because I'm telling you what, <coughs> librarians are too important. Our mission is too great. Our consequences of our inaction are too dire to sit back and sit in our rooms and be have those panic attacks and say, what do I do now? Take the 42 steps. Call each other. Email each other. Figure it out. Because what happened in Evanston, what happened in Chicago, what happened all over this state, what happened in Columbus and Cleveland, what happened in Colorado and Denver, et cetera, what happens there now is a ripple effect through us all. Together, we are stronger. If Mike wants to know what the future of librarianship is, it is you. And it's the people that you touch, and it's the people that you talk through, and it's the people that you help. We can survive together. We can be stronger together, and it's going to be scary as hell. And you're, if you do it alone, you're going to get stuck, and you're going to sit in bed, and you're going to say, I can't do it. Or you're going to give up, and you're going to just say, throw the meds back on. I'm done. And when that happens, when you see a fellow worker who's hit that, when you go back, and you will, you go back to your organization and you find the person who didn't want to get up that day. It's going to be your job to say, get up. 42 steps. 42 steps. 42 steps. Because that's what this field's about. That's what this program is about. That's what librarianship's about. Because we're going to say that to our coworkers. We're going to say that to our colleagues. We're going to say that across library type. We're going to say that across organization type. We're going to say that to our government. We're going to say that to our faculty. We're going to say that to our students. We're going to say that to our communities. And by God, librarianship is going to make the whole of society walk those 42 steps to where it could be a better day. We are among us have that power to energize our communities, to look beyond the resources we bring and look at the expertise and look at their expertise and say, today you matter, today you matter, today you matter, today is your first birthday. Today we're going to move ahead and we're going to do it together. That's what this program is about. That's what you do after this. God bless you. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Woo!